This presentation is part of a series of video trainings on family law put together by the Urban Justice Center's Domestic Violence Project. This training will focus on orders of protection in New York City. This training is designed to provide general information on orders of protection. It is not designed to provide legal advice or guidance on any particular case or matter. When in doubt, ask a lawyer. To begin, it is important to understand that there are different types of legal proceedings and different courts hear different types of cases. In New York, the family courts hear the following types of cases, custody and visitation, support cases, including child support and spousal support, family offense proceedings, abuse and neglect cases, juvenile delinquency cases, and PINS cases which stands for Persons in Need of Supervision. The next course that I want to discuss is the Supreme Court. Contrary to popular misconception, in New York, the Supreme Court is not the highest court in the state. Instead, it is the court that handles matters of divorce. Please refer to our training on divorce for more information on that. The third court I'm going to mention is the Integrated Domestic Violence Court, or IDV. IDV hears cases where there is both a criminal case and family or matrimonial case involved. Note, not all criminal cases involving domestic violence will end up in IDV, but some do. Now that we understand the types of cases and the different courts that can hear them, who are the players? You may already be familiar with the players in a criminal case from TV and movies. In a criminal case, the government brings a case against a defendant after a crime has been committed. For example, the People versus O.J. Simpson. In family court, the players are a little different. The parties to the case are called the petitioner and the respondent. The petitioner is the person who starts the court proceeding by filing the petition and the respondent is the person who the proceeding is against. For example, Ryan and Taylor are married. Ryan throws a glass and hits Taylor. Taylor files a family offense petition against Ryan. Here, Taylor is the petitioner because Taylor filed the petition, and Ryan is the respondent because Ryan has the chance to respond to Taylor's petition. Next, we have the Attorneys for the Children, or AFCs. If children are involved in a family court proceeding, the court may assign an attorney to represent the child's interests. This varies by court, but it should be noted that when it comes to orders of protection, an AFC will typically only be assigned if the order is on behalf of a child. Then we have the Referees and Judges. Family court matters are determined by a judge or a referee. Even though they are called different things, the role of a referee and judge are essentially the same when it comes to orders of protection. These are the people who issue orders and make determinations based on the facts presented. The main difference between a referee and a judge is that when appearing before a referee, the parties will be asked to consent to the referee's authority to hear and determine the case. Once consent is obtained, referee orders function in the same way as judge-made orders. If the parties do not consent to the referee's authority to issue orders, the protocol varies from borough to borough. Some courts will send the case to a judge to be heard, while others will allow the referee to continue to hear the case, but will ask the referee to take notes to send to a judge, who then gets to make the final decision. An 18B is a court-appointed attorney. You've heard it on every cop show. You have the right to an attorney. If you cannot afford one, one will be provided for you free of charge. Although those Miranda rights are talking specifically about criminal constitutional rights, the same principle applies to custody, visitation matters, and orders of protection in family court. You have the right to an attorney. If the court determines that you cannot afford one, they may assign you one for free and these attorneys are called 18Bs. Some judges will require proof of income to make this determination. It is good practice to bring along pay stubs, tax returns, 
proof of public benefit, or a letter from an employer when asking for an 18B to make the process go smoother. And finally, we have ACS or CPS, which is the Administration for Children's Services or Child Protective Services. These are the investigators who look into allegations of abuse and neglect of minors. In some cases, the judge or referee may order a court-ordered investigation, COI. During these investigations, an ACS worker will visit the homes of both parties and submit a report to the court. Before we go any further though, there are a few safety-related things that you should be aware of before filing a petition. For starters, it's not always safe to file in court. Although you may want to immediately go to court to have a judge hear your case, it may not be the best choice for you. When you file something as the petitioner, the respondent must be notified. Remember, it's in their name. They are the respondent because they have the right to respond to what was filed, and they can't do that if they don't know it was filed. You should also know that the respondent can file a petition in response. For example, if Avery files a petition against Chris for an order of protection, Chris can file a cross petition for an order of protection in response. Chris could also file another type of case, such as a custody petition or child support petition, if the parties have children in common. You should also think about address confidentiality. If you do decide to file a petition, you can request to keep your address confidential from the other party on court papers. You do this by filing an address confidentiality affidavit. But remember, this is a request. It is not a guarantee. And finally, you should also think about safety planning around court appearances. The respondent doesn't just have the right to be notified of a proceeding and to respond to it. The respondent has the right to respond in person. So you should be prepared to see the other party in court. Okay. Great. So we know a little bit about the types of different cases that there are. We know the courts that can hear and determine these types of cases. We know the main players involved in these cases. And we know some of the main safety concerns surrounding these cases and filing. Now we can talk about orders of protection. Well, what is an order of protection? An order of protection may sometimes be referred to as a restraining order. It is a legal document signed by a judge or referee that says that someone who has harmed or threatened another person is not allowed to do certain things as a result. The specific limitations of an order of protection vary based on the circumstances of the order itself. You can file an order of protection on behalf of yourself or on behalf of your minor child. You can also include pets on an order of protection too. Where can I get an order of protection? In New York State, Family Court, Supreme Court, and Criminal Court have concurrent jurisdiction over orders of protection. This means, for example, that a person can have an order of protection from Criminal Court and an order of protection from Family Court at the same time regarding the same incident. Criminal orders of protection can be issued generally for victims of a crime, regardless of who the perpetrator is. This is important to note because the same is not true for family court orders of protection. Another thing to be aware of is that when it comes to criminal orders of protection, the district attorney is in control of whether or not to issue an OP and when that OP should end. This makes sense, because remember, when we talked about the players in legal cases, criminal cases are brought by the government, so the government is the entity in control. Here's an example of a criminal court order of protection. Notice that in the top left corner, there is a space for the judge's name, and under that it says, People of the State of New York. This is indicating what we just discussed. Criminal cases are brought by the government on behalf of the people. The order also includes a notice to the defendant stating that failure to comply may result in a mandatory arrest, criminal prosecution, and possible incarceration. 
The notice also indicates whether or not the order is temporary or final. Throughout the remainder of the document, there are a series of check boxes for the ordering judge to select. The boxes checked will vary from case to case. Before we move on though, I want to draw your attention to the bottom of the second page of the OP. In bold it reads, it is further ordered that this order of protection shall remain in force until and including such and such date. OPs do not last forever so it is important to take note of the expiration date. Moving on to Supreme Court OPs. The Supreme Court can issue orders of protection between parties who are married or who are in the process of getting a divorce. Looking at the first page of the OP, we can notice some differences between this OP and the criminal OP we just looked at. For example, the Supreme Court order lists two parties, the plaintiff, petitioner, and the defendant, respondent. Much like with the criminal OP, the rest of the document has a series of checkboxes indicating the restrictions placed by the order. If a box is not checked, that restriction is not in effect. And lastly, we have family court OPs. They look something like this. You can notice some similarities between this OP and the two we just looked at, such as the notice to obey and the listing of the parties. On a family court OP, however, there is a section explaining that the OP was ordered in a response to a family offense petition. Once again, a large part of the order consists of possible restrictions that can be put in place if checked. Towards the bottom of the third page, there is a notice about the ability to appeal the order of protection. Under the Family Court Act, you have 30 days to respond and contest an order of protection that has been issued against you, 35 days if you receive notice by mail. The Family Court can issue orders of protection between members of the same family or household, and the remainder of this presentation will focus primarily on Family Court orders of protection. But really quickly before we do, Here's a chart outlining some of the main differences between the process of obtaining a criminal OP and the process of obtaining a family court OP. In criminal court, the case begins when a crime is reported to the police. The perpetrator is then arrested and charged with a crime, and a temporary order of protection is issued. The victim of the offense will usually be required to cooperate with the district attorney's office, which is in control of the case. The standard of proof in a criminal matter is beyond a reasonable doubt. Criminal cases can be heard by a bench trial, meaning just by the judge, or by a jury. And finally, the purpose of criminal cases is punitive. With family court, the case begins when a petition is filed. The victim petitioner then speaks to a referee or judge, and a temporary order of protection is issued. Here, the petitioner is the one in control of the case and is responsible for providing allegations. The standard of proof is by a preponderance of the evidence. There are no jury trials when it comes to family offense proceedings in family court. And unlike the punitive purpose of the criminal courts, the purpose of family offense proceedings in family court is to preserve the safety and stability of the family. So how do we get an OP from family court? If you'll recall, when we talked about criminal OPs, we learned that criminal OPs can be issued generally for victims of a crime regardless of who the perpetrator is. And we noted that that is not the case for family court OPs. The family court is a court of limited jurisdiction, meaning that it can only hear cases which arise between members of the same family or household. This makes sense, 
because we just learned that the purpose of family court is to preserve the safety and stability of the family unit. No family involvement, no family court. But who exactly counts as family? The Family Court Act defines members of the same family or household as persons related to each other by blood or adoption, persons who are legally married to one another, persons who were once married to each other, regardless of whether they still live in the same household, persons who have a child together, regardless of whether they have ever been married, and regardless of whether they have ever lived together, and finally, persons who are or have been involved in an intimate relationship, regardless of whether they have lived together at any time. So this includes boyfriends and girlfriends. Three things to note. The court will look at factors to determine if there is an intimate relationship, such as the nature and type of relationship, regardless of whether the relationship is sexual in nature, the frequency of interaction between the persons, and the duration of the relationship. A casual acquaintance or business relationship is not enough to constitute an intimate relationship. And finally, undocumented individuals may access the family court. The court should not ask about immigration status when determining whether an OP should be issued. What are the various types of OPs? There are different types of orders of protection that the family court issues. Under a limited OP, the respondent must refrain from committing any family offense or criminal offense against the petitioner. Essentially, it allows the respondent to be around the petitioner, contact the petitioner, even live with the petitioner, but orders that the respondent be on their best behavior, so to speak. Under a full stay-away OP, as its name suggests, the respondent must stay away from the petitioner and any place that the petitioner is likely to be, such as their home, place of work, or their children's school. A full OP may also include a no-contact provision, meaning that the respondent cannot contact the petitioner by calling, texting, or using social media, although the court can allow for exceptions where needed. For example, if the order prohibits the respondent from contacting the petitioner, they can do so with the exception that the respondent can contact the petitioner only in writing and only about the care of their shared children. When a petitioner wants to get a full stay-away order against a respondent who lives with them, it's called an exclusionary order, which excludes the respondent from the home. Note, it doesn't matter whether the home is in the petitioner's name or in the respondent's name. You should also know that it is a higher bar to establish the need for an exclusionary order, and even where issued, there should be a hearing within seven days of the exclusion to determine whether the respondent's removal from the home is necessary to protect the petitioner from imminent harm. In addition to the basic instructions of an OP, a family court OP can include some additional terms. It can allow a party to collect belongings with a police escort. It can revoke or suspend firearm licenses Although rare, a family court OP can grant temporary child support or institute a temporary order of custody. Best practice, though, is to still file a separate petition for custody and child support. See our additional trainings on these topics for more information on that. And once again, it can include pets. So we now understand what an OP can consist of but we already know that orders of protection are not intended to last forever. So what are the different time restraints for OPs? You can have a temporary OP or a final OP. A temporary OP generally lasts from court date to court date until the case is over. A final OP can be issued at the end of a case and generally lasts for one to two years. Where needed, however, a final OP can be extended for up to five years with evidence of aggravating circumstances, such as physical injury, use of a weapon, and a history of repeated violations of prior OPs. This all sounds great. How do we get one? What are the grounds for obtaining an order of protection in family court? Family court orders of protection are heard and determined through family offense proceedings. 
At these hearings, a referee or judge can issue an order of protection where it has been determined that the respondent committed one or more of the enumerated family offenses. Family offenses are defined according to the New York Penal Code. This means that the respondent's behavior has to meet the definition of one of these crimes for the family court to step in. As you can see, there are many different crimes which qualify as family offenses under Article 8 of the Family Court Act. The newest addition to the group of family offenses is the offense of unlawful dissemination or publication of an intimate image, which went into effect in September 2019. This offense makes it unlawful for a person to share naked pictures or videos of another person without their consent. It should be noted that these intimate images do not need to include the other person's face to qualify. It is sufficient that the person in the image be identifiable in some way, for example, by a birthmark or a tattoo. A family offense proceeding is initiated by filing a family offense petition. This petition outlines the relationship between the parties, the alleged offenses committed, and the relief sought. Once you've decided that you can file and that you want to file, where can you file? You can file a family offense petition in the borough where either party lives or the borough where the incidents alleged occurred. For example, Peyton lives in Staten Island and Sawyer lives in Manhattan. The alleged family offenses occurred in Brooklyn. The family offense petition can be filed in Staten Island, Manhattan, or Brooklyn family courts, but not Queens or the Bronx. There may be some safety reasons why a person might choose to file in one borough over another. For example, if Peyton doesn't know that Sawyer lives in Manhattan, Sawyer may want to file in Staten Island or Brooklyn to avoid tipping Peyton off to their location. When can you file? There is no statute of limitations when it comes to what offenses you can include in a family offense petition. This means that if Reese and Morgan have been married for 20 years and Reese wants to file a family offense petition against Morgan, Reese's petition can include incidents that occurred 19 years ago. That being said, although there is no statute of limitations for what can be included, it is still best to try to file as soon as possible after the incidents occurred. This is because you want to show the court why you need the order of protection now. It can be helpful, though, to add older incidents to show the court the pattern of behavior over time. So let's talk a little bit about the petition itself and how to draft a facially sufficient petition. State the facts that make out the offenses and don't focus on things unrelated to the offenses. Tell the court when the incident occurred as best as you can. You can put in the exact date if you are sure when the incident occurred, but as a general rule, it is good practice to say on or about just to be safe. For example, let's say you thought the incident occurred on January 1st, 2000, but the incident actually happened at 1 a.m. on January 2nd, 2000. Saying on or about gives you some room for that error. If you don't know the exact date, that's okay. Try to say at least the month and the year, or the season and the year, like spring, 2000. Be specific about the respondent's conduct and language. Profanity is okay. Keep in mind that the petitioner will have to prove the allegations included in the petition. Ask for specific relief in the petition. Remember what we spoke about earlier. Are you asking for a full stay away order or a limited order? You have to keep in mind that the court doesn't know anything about what happened. It is the petitioner's job to explain the facts as they experience them. If the petition is not specific, the court may not understand the need for an order of protection, or the court may issue a limited order when a full stay away order is actually needed. 
All right, explain this to me like I'm a two-year-old, okay? Because there's an element to this thing. I just cannot get through my thick head. When the petitioner files a family offense petition, the first appearance occurs on the same day the petition is filed. This appearance is an ex parte hearing. This means that the petitioner appears before a referee or judge without the respondent present. The judge or referee will review the petition and will decide whether or not to issue a temporary order of protection. They will also decide what terms will be part of the OP. Remember the checkboxes from when we looked at the OP samples earlier. The judge or referee will usually ask the sheriff to serve a copy of the OP and petition on the respondent for free if they have information such as the respondent's address. If not, they may ask the petitioner to arrange for service. We'll discuss that in just a moment. And finally, the judge or referee will pick another date which is called the return of process date. But before we move on, I do want to mention one quick safety planning note. Although the petitioner can ask for specific relief, the terms of the OP are up to the judge. Because of this, it is always a good idea to plan for what happens if the OP is not issued or if the terms the petitioner asks for are not granted. For example, if the petitioner asks for an exclusionary order and it's not granted, will the petitioner go home or will the petitioner leave? Where will the petitioner go? How will the respondent react to seeing the limited OP? Maybe instead of asking the sheriff to serve, the petitioner asks to arrange service themselves to have more control over when the respondent gets the papers. These are just some things to keep in mind when filing. Service. Hey, Dr. Avery. Yeah. Dr. Jackson Avery. That's right. Do we? You've been served. Have a good night, guys. Remember, we learned earlier that the respondent must be notified of the family offense proceeding and be given the opportunity to respond. Service is the way that the respondent becomes notified. New York State requires personal service which means that a person must be served by someone who is not a party to the case, so not the petitioner and not the respondent, and over the age of 18. The paper served must include the summons to appear, which tells the respondent when to come to court, a copy of the temporary OP issued, which tells the respondent what the rules are that they need to follow, and a copy of the petition itself, which tells the respondent what the petitioner says happened. Proper service cannot occur on a Sunday, and service must be completed at least 24 hours before the return of process date for an order of protection. The person who serves the respondent should fill out a document called an Affidavit of Service. This document should be signed by the person who served the respondent in front of a notary. This document tells the court things like when and where the respondent got the papers and confirms that the respondent was the person who did in fact receive the documents. The police or sheriff are obligated to attempt service for free. If they do perform service, the police or sheriff will send the affidavit of service directly to the court. Note, although the police or sheriff can serve the papers, it is not required that service be performed by an officer of the law in order for it to be proper. That being said, you must remember that any orders issued will not be in effect until properly served. The first official court date is the return of process date. This is where the petitioner proves that the respondent was properly served by giving the court the original affidavit of service. If service was done, then expect both parties to appear. Both parties may ask for an attorney during this court date. The court will assign a free court attorney to individuals who cannot afford representation. If the court determines that a party does not qualify for a free attorney, then the party will decide if they want time to hire a lawyer or proceed and represent themselves. If the party wants time to find a lawyer, 
the judge or referee should set a new court date and give that party time to find representation. If the party waives the right to an attorney, the court can proceed. Generally, though, the court will adjourn the case anyway for another date to see if the parties can work towards a resolution on their own. If the respondent does not appear, but the petitioner can show proof that the respondent was properly served, the court will usually set another court date and mail a notice to the respondent. This notice will let the respondent know that if they fail to appear again, the case will proceed without them. However, the court doesn't have to do this. The court could just decide to proceed with the case without the defendant on that day, without attempting to notify them a second time. Although, this is not common. But what if there are problems with service? Sometimes there are issues with service. For example, if the respondent was served on a Sunday. Or there can be a problem with the affidavit of service itself. For example, if it was not signed by a notary. If the problem is with the service itself, the court can either order the service be done again, or if the respondent is present, they can waive the defect in service, meaning that they acknowledge that there were problems with service, but they are not going to make an issue out of it. If the problem is with the affidavit of service, the petitioner can ask for time to amend or fix the affidavit of service to show that the respondent was properly served previously. If there are problems with service, the petitioner can ask for another opportunity to attempt service. If the other party appears, the petitioner can ask to serve the respondent on the record in court. It is up to the respondent whether or not to agree. If the respondent agrees, the case can proceed that day. If the respondent does not agree, the court will require the petitioner to have the respondent served outside of court. Even if there are issues with service, the petitioner must still show up to the return of process date. If the petitioner does not appear, the case will be dismissed. If the case is dismissed, the petitioner needs to start the process all over again if they still want an OP. We already know that the court will issue temporary orders of protection between court dates. But let's talk about the resolution of the proceedings, or rather, how the case ends. There are a number of ways a family offense proceeding can be resolved. The first is on consent. This means that the parties come to an agreement and settle the case. This means that the parties are in agreement about how long the order of protection will be and the terms. Note, the parties cannot agree to an OP longer than two years. The second is withdrawal. Remember, when we talked about criminal OPs, we said that the DA is in control of the order. With family court OPs, the petitioner is in control, which means that at any time, the petitioner may ask to withdraw their petition without prejudice, meaning that if a petitioner withdraws, they can file again in the future if they feel they need to. Although, if the petitioner does withdraw the case, any OPs issued will no longer be in effect. The third way is a resolution on default after inquest. If at any time the respondent fails to appear in court after being properly served, the judge may proceed with an inquest. An inquest is a one-sided trial where the petitioner answers questions under oath about what happened. Based on the testimony, the judge or referee will decide whether or not to issue an order. If they do issue an order, they'll decide how long that order will last and what terms will be included. The final way a family offense proceeding may be resolved is by trial. If a family offense proceeding goes to trial, the petitioner must establish, beyond a preponderance of the evidence, that the respondent committed the alleged family offenses. They may do this by offering witnesses, testimony, or evidence. The respondent will also have the opportunity to rebut the petitioner's case by offering their own evidence. After trial, the judge or referee will decide if a family offense was committed. 
if an OP should be issued, and what the term should be. Enforcing the OP. So you have this piece of paper. What do you do with it? A family court OP can be enforced by the family court, but it can also be enforced by the criminal court. If once issued and served, the respondent violates an order of protection, the petitioner can call 911 or make a report at a precinct. Violations of a family court OP result in mandatory arrests. This arrest will establish a new criminal case against the respondent, and the petitioner will get an additional OP from the criminal courts. The petitioner can also report a violation of an OP by going to family court and filing a violation petition. Although, unlike with a report to the police, this petition does not necessarily lead to the respondent's arrest. It is also important to note that a petitioner cannot violate an order of protection in their own favor. For example, if Dana and Jamie are in a relationship and Jamie gets an OP against Dana, preventing Dana from calling Jamie, under that OP, Jamie is still allowed to call Dana, but Dana is not allowed to pick up. That being said, if the petitioner does reach out to the respondent, the petitioner may have a harder time enforcing the order of protection later on. So now we've walked through the process of obtaining an order of protection in New York City from start to finish. I hope that this video tutorial has been helpful and informative. As a reminder though, the information provided here is general and is not intended to be a substitute for legal advice on any particular legal matter. As always, when in doubt, ask a lawyer. Thanks for watching.